Amen. We are in a journey of pursuit. We are in pursuit. And as we go through 2020, it's, it's our hearts cry that we will um, get closer to Jesus, that we will pursue him and all that he is so that we can know his leading for not only this church, but leading for us personally. And I hope that you're making this journey personal. I hope that um, you are, are beginning to really pursue harder than you've ever pursued him before because there's so much more that he has to offer. And as, as each of us individually begins to pursue harder, then in unity, we as a body can do more and we can reach farther into the community. Amen? Amen. The first week that we talked about in pursuit, we said, pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. He is everything. Everything else that we talk about pursuing starts and finishes with Jesus. And the question was posed to you, who do you say Jesus is? Is he a sidebar on your life or is he everything about your day? And then, second one is pursue holiness. You remember that? Scripture says, be holy for I am holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's a command that we pursue holiness. It's a command that we, we pursue uh, integrity of the heart. It's a, it's a command that in our integrity that we are inside and outside um, pursuing holiness, the things seen and unseen. That means we willfully put down sinful behavior and choose Jesus rather than worldly pleasure. We choose Jesus rather than gratifying the deeds of the flesh. So today we're talking about pursuing the love of God. Still going? All right, there we go. Um, his love, like his other attributes that we've been talking about, could, we could spend hours talking about just that one thing. There is so much to talk about. It's huge. Yet it was the love of God that drove him out of his love to come to earth and pursue us. It drove him to provide a way of salvation so that we can live with him forever. And his love, it works hand in hand with his justice. It works hand in hand with his grace. It works hand in hand with his holiness. And his, his love out of in, in conjunction with all his other attributes, such as holiness, is how he mentors us and disciplines us and grows us up in the faith. We can't separate his love from his other attributes. And discipline is, would be similar to how parents discipline their children. We discipline them because we love them. We want them to grow and mature into functional competent adults that's the goal who love jesus and so we discipline them as needed so that they will have that and so god's love disciplines us much in the same way it's his love for us and his passionate desire for his church to be with him that drives him to a limitless pursuit of us did you know that Jesus pursues you, he pursues you, each one of you. He's pursuing your heart. He's pursuing your family who doesn't yet know him. He's pursuing your children who have walked away. He's pursuing his church to come and, and, and get that, um, that love relationship that a like he considered us his bride. He wants the love of the bride to begin to rise in a powerful way of pursuit for him. The groomsman is looking forward to that ultimate wedding feast that we read about in, in Revelation. 
He's looking forward to that. And so he wants his bride to be completely wrapped up and totally in love with him when that time comes, ready for his return. His love is not an either-or thing. It's not a, an either-or characteristic where we either have a God of love or we have a God who's judgmental. We have a God of grace or we have a God who expects us to do a lot of stuff out of duty for him. It's not an either-or thing. God loves us and requires um, us to search him out. His disciplines are fully wrapped up in his love. His holiness is wrapped up in his love. Scripture says that God is holy, like we talked about, but it also says God is love. And so we can't separate that. 1 John 4, 16 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So I want to explore with you today what some of the qualities of God's love is. What are the qualities that motivates us to both draw near to him and also give it away? It's the, the part of our relationship with Christ that we need not only to gain, but we need to give it away. And as we gain more, we have more to give away. We gain and we give it away. But we can't give away what we don't have. And so then what does it look like to pursue God in such a way that we can receive and give away on a consistent basis? And is it even possible to know the level of love that goes beyond head knowledge? And when I use the word know here, I'm not talking about no. I'm talking about no as in experience, to have an encounter with his love. Scripture uses the word know in the Bible in a few different ways. First of all, to know is to understand. Jesus would ask, do you understand what I'm telling you? To have head knowledge about something. The facts, we know the facts. To perceive, it's that knowing that is unspoken. You, you know something is happening with maybe a crowd of people. You know something's happening inside of a person just because you're perceiving something from them. It's the unspoken knowing. And then, to experience or encounter, to know somebody intimately is to experience life with them, encounter moments with them. And so, know in Scripture where it's talking about we can know the love of God is not talking about a head knowledge of knowing. It's talking about an encounter with his love. So let me share with you a prayer that Paul spoke over the church in Ephesus. He says partly, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, so that rooted and established, that is I know I am grounded. You know, when a, a tree has deep roots in the ground, it takes a, an awful big wind to blow it, right? It's, it's firm. I know. It's part of my DNA that I am rooted and grounded. I'm established in God's love. That you being rooted and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people, the church, to grasp... How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ to grasp. Sometimes we say, I've grasped that, that what I'm being taught. So we can grasp something. I got it. I've got this. Or we can grasp something tangibly. I've got it. We can grasp how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love. There's the word no, this love that surpasses knowledge. It goes past the head. I'm experiencing it. I'm encountering his love. And that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In my knowing, in my encounter, in my experience, I am being filled to the measure of the fullness of God. 
goes past knowledge, head knowledge. If you were to explain to me how a rocket engine is built, I could write down all of, what, three steps, is it? I doubt it. Probably more like a thousand steps if you were to list it. I could write them down, you know. So I, I, I would have some sort of head knowledge about that. But you know what? I could never understand it. I could never perceive it. I could never tangibly grasp it because it goes beyond my ability to understand science and chemistry or anything else that goes into it. I have no idea. But in Ephesians, it tells me that I can grasp something that's even greater than a rocket engine. I can grasp how deep and wide and high is the perfect love of Jesus. Will I ever grasp it 100%? Not on this side of eternity. But I can grasp enough that will do me my lifetime. And so I want to explore three facets of God's love with you this morning. The first is God's love is extravagant. Say extravagant. The dictionary defines extravagant as exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. And a couple other words that help to bring definition to it is profuse, which is pouring forth liberally, and lavish, which means expended or produced in abundance. Hmm. When God does something, he does it beyond what's necessary. Look at the oceans he put in the, in the world. I mean, did we need all that water? He did it. He gave us a liberal amount of all that water. He exceeds the limits of reason or necessity. He pours it forth liberally. He lavishes it on us. Even scripture says, in 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. The kind of love that God demonstrates is active and creative, and it calls us the children of God. When it says calls us, that word calling, it means more than just naming us. It means an inauguration of a relationship. He's inaugurated a relationship with you that he calls you his child. And that relationship is, is best pictured sometimes by the metaphor of parents and children. God's creative act of love. We belong to God as surely and permanently as children are to their natural parents. And John emphasizes when he writes further, he says, and that's what we are. Now we are children of God. We don't simply look at, at, at a love that's out there somewhere and think, wow, that's so beautiful. We have a love that is internalized. It's inside of me because God is love. And I can marvel at, at, the, at the love that resides inside of me because I can experience it. The extravagant love of God allows us as believers to place our self-worth in him. In the fact that he loves us, we are his children now, not at some time in the future. We are his children now. We are God's children, and we're becoming more and more of a greater reflection of who he is as we grow and go deeper into his love and, and ex explore his character. See, we're created to be a reflection of him. And that reflection in our pursuit should cause us to run from sin and, and want to just bathe and be lavished in his love. The Passion Translation reads it this way, Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. Love those words. This love is agape love, which is an affectionate and a benevolent love. And I even looked it up in Strong's Greek Translation Dictionary. Further, it describes it as <laughs> a love feast 
and to love with affectionate regard. Isn't those cool words? A love feast. He regards you highly. His love is extravagant. When we pursue the love of Jesus, we are pursuing an affectionate encounter with him. We are pursuing an experience of his love which causes us to continue to move more and more closer and closer towards him so we can be like him and then so we can give it away. That's the goal, to give it away to those who need it too. We can have all the head knowledge, all the facts listed about Jesus' love, but until, until we encounter his love, and are filled with his love, we will never know the wonderfully overwhelming depths of it and be able to give it away. See, it's one thing to be able to share with other people the facts, but it's another thing entirely to be able to say, I have experienced the love of Jesus, and this is what it is, and I want to give it away to you. Totally. I mean, anybody can get facts from anywhere. But to be able to share your experience of knowing his love, that's what changes people. Facts don't change people. Experience does. And so God's love is extravagant. And then God's love is radical. Radical in the dictionary defines it as being very different from the usual or traditional. Other words to further describe it, extreme, going to great lengths, exceeding the ordinary to the greatest possible extent, and revolutionary, activity designed to affect fundamental change. I think what Jesus did, because he loves us, I think that was extreme. I think it was radical. The fact that our King, our Savior, our God, would leave glory And come down to the earth, be born of a virgin in a stable, humble himself, grow up, start his ministry, choose 12 of the motley crew to work with him, teach them the gospel, teach them what it is to love, teach them how to do the signs, wonders, and miracles like he did, and send them off. Then go to the cross for us, and die for us, suffer what he did, I think that's radical. No other king would do that. And so we have a a God who loves us radically, extreme. He went to great lengths. He exceeded the ordinary. And Jesus, I think he, he... made the the greatest revolutionary change in history with the gospel. Then there's one other word that I think I like too, is crazy. Which in this case is passionately preoccupied. See, it would take Jesus to be passionately preoccupied with the goal of his affection when he died on the cross, to be able to to go through all that he did. He saw every one of our faces when he was going through that suffering. He saw you and me in the future, and he said, you're worth it. You're worth it. That's crazy. He was passionately preoccupied with us. He went to great lengths to demonstrate just how much he desires a relationship with us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us that in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, we can't separate the love of Jesus from the cross. And the fact that he came and demonstrated that love before we could offer it back. While we were still in our sin, while we were still rebellious, while we still wanted to do it on our own, Jesus died for us so that we could be free. I have a friend who was sharing a conversation between herself and 
someone else she was talking to, she shared this conversation with me, and the other person was, I don't know, of Muslim or Hindu or one of the Eastern faiths. And the other person was asking, what's the difference between your God and my God? And I thought her answer was brilliant. She said, well, your God, you have to go looking for. But my God, he came looking for me. That's the difference. The great lengths he went to in order to bring a revolutionary change to the world was radical, and it was extreme. It was crazy. Francis Chan, he wrote a book called Crazy Love. Anybody know Francis Chan? His book, Crazy Love. He says that when he talks about being in love with Jesus, he talks about being in love with him through experience. He said, it can't be a legalistic thing where we love out of duty. It has to be out of this crazy love relationship with him. You see, his love is not a legal thing. It's not something we work to earn. It's not something that we can do anything better in order to receive. We can't experience this radical uh, love unless we pursue it. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we can pursue him, the more we can experience it. And then thirdly, his love is tenacious. The dictionary defines that as not easily pulled apart, persistent in seeking something valued or desired. A couple other words to help out is stout, which suggests an ability to endure stress and pain, and stalwart, which suggests an unshakable dependability unshakable dependability. He will always be dependable. Scripture says he is faithful. He will never let you down. An ability to endure stress and pain. That's not his stress and pain. He has the ability to endure our stress and pain. When we go through moments where we think, God, I don't know if I can do this. God, I'm not sure it's totally worth it. God, I'm hurting. God, I've been offended. Our stress and pain. God, I'm going through so much grief right now. Where are you? He has the ability to endure our stress and pain, our anxiety, our depression, our hurt. He doesn't leave. He stays close by, even though sometimes... We, it's hard to feel him always, but he's close by, and he's, he's ever got his arms open for you to run back to his love, to climb up into an embrace with him because of his love. He has the ability to endure, and he's totally dependable. Psalm 139 talks about this. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, um, but if, if you need encouragement that God knows you, he knows where you're at, read Psalm 139. David talks about, you've searched me, Lord. When I sit and when I rise, you know me. You discern my goings and my comings. You know how I speak. You know what words I'm going to say. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, you're there. You're guiding me. Even when I was being created in my mother's womb, you saw me and you counted my days. You had all my days planned before I even breathed a breath for one of them. Your eyes saw me. And then he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. God thinks of you. He thinks of you, and he has wonderful things that he's thinking about you. And so sometimes you go in and you spend those moments of prayer and just getting into his presence, and God, what do you think about me? What are you saying to me today? And we can have a beautiful, almost a con conversation, you know. He tells you what he's thinking about you. 
And it can be such a beautiful moment if you allow it to be. Jeremiah, we all know Jeremiah 29 and 11. He knows the plans he has for you. He's got a hope and a future for you. When you call on him, he'll listen. When we seek him, we will find him. That's a promise that we have. There's a scripture also that tells us that God is a jealous God. He's jealous for you and me. It's not the kind of jealousy that makes him angry or offended or any of that, but it's the kind of jealousy that he, he's pursuing your heart. Do you remember when you had your first falling in love, maybe many years ago? That person that, oh, I just love them. And maybe you had plans to get married. But you, you were so in love with them, you, you so wanted their heart to return that love to you, that if there was anything that would threaten that relationship, anything that would threaten their heart, maybe growing cold towards you, you would do anything to keep it. Remember that feeling? You would do anything to spend time with that person. That's the kind of jealous love that God has for you. He will do anything for you, anything to keep your heart from being stolen from other to, stolen and, and sent to other people or places or things, material wealth, anything. He wants to keep your heart. But you know, he's not a God who will force you. He wants you to choose to love him. Romans 5, 5 says that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You know that word pour in that verse? It literally involves being tipped over, overflowing, and gushing into our life. See, the Holy Spirit is like liquid pouring into our heart. Filling us to overflowing, and the flavor of that liquid is love. Jesus modeled God's love. He touched the untouchables. He spoke to the forsaken. He reached the unreachable. And Jesus' death on the cross demonstrated the depth of God's love. We know the popular verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, that whosoever is, you can put each one of our names in there. So that when Visa believes in him, I won't perish, but I will have everlasting life. You can put your own name in there because he loves you. An object's value is always determined by the price paid for it. The item on the auction block, it might look like a piece of worthless wood to one person. It might look like something that could hang on a wall in the basement to another. Still, to another, it might look like uh, a, an instrument that maybe a beginning student could use. But to the person who knows its value, if he knows that it was built by Stallworth, he knows its value, and he will pay a good price for it. Stallworth violins... People will pay millions of dollars for one because of the quality of it and because of who made it. But if you don't know the value of it, eh, I just hang it on the wall. It correlates to the price paid for it. I read somewhere that somebody paid like $16 million for one of those. The value of God's payment for us tells us how much we are worth to him. Our value is high. And when we realize that the eternal God of the universe who has a holy pleasure when he looks at us, that he doesn't want to harm me, but he wants to do good, his opinion of me is not contingent on anything that I do. When I realize that, it can revolutionize my life. See, we all have the same promise. His love is unconditional, it's free, and all we have to do is experience it and accept it and rejoice in it. His love 
is tenacious. So what does all that mean for us as we live out our Christian walk? The New Testament tells us what the greatest two commandments are. What's, what's the first one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second, he says, is like it. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything in Scripture hangs on these two things. Oh, and by the way, 1 John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And not just those two, but you're going to keep them all. However, if you keep the first two, the rest are easy. Love God and love your neighbor with all your heart, and the rest is easy. So here we're drawing closer to God's love. He's filling us up. He's pouring his liquid love into our hearts. What do we do with it? Well, first of all, we return it back to him. Second of all, we love others with it and give it away. How do we do that? John, 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. That's how we love each other. And it's not just doing something resentfully or out of duty, but love must be sincere. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter, and Paul teaches that we can be the most gifted person, the most qualified person, the person who has the biggest faith that can move mountains, I can possess all knowledge. I can be a wonderful, benevolent person, have a lot on my resume to brag about. But if I lack love, I have nothing. And so how do we express love in a way that will truly impact others? There are things that love does and things that love doesn't do. Love is patient, even when my agenda is falling behind. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. We need to be a church that builds a culture of honor. It's too easy to dishonor people. We must learn to honor other people. Speak highly of them. Refrain from criticism. Refrain from gossip. We must learn to honor the other people. Speak well of them. Give of yourself to them. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in what's evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Wow, what a tall list. But you know what? Love never fails. It never fails. So God's love is extravagant, it's radical, and it's tenacious. Jesus desires to pour the abundance of his love into our hearts so we can both return it back to him and give it away. We're in a day where the bride needs to get ready for the groomsmen to come. We're in a day when the church needs to really get on board with what it means to love God passionately. We're living in a day when the pursuit of the church must be Jesus. And so I want to know more about Jesus' love. I want to encounter more of Jesus' love. Is that your heart too? Do you want to be filled with some liquid love? I do. And it's been my prayer for you this week that 
we would have that encounter with Jesus this morning with his liquid love. Perhaps you've not known beyond the head knowledge. Perhaps you've got lots of head knowledge and you see it out there, but this morning you're saying, you know what? I want love that surpasses knowledge. I want to experience what surpasses what's in my head. Maybe you've never, ever experienced or encountered the love of God ever, and you would like to this morning. And I believe that if we open up our hearts to receive a little more this morning, that God will do that. If we ask him, he wants to pour into our hearts. He's looking for us to pursue his love, and the Holy Spirit will respond. So we're going to give the, the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do that this morning. We're going to play a song called Reckless Love. You might know it. If you do, you can sing along. If you don't know it, listen to the words. And as the song is being played, begin to ask Holy Spirit to pour in his liquid love. And as the song is being played, don't wait for it to finish, but as the song is being played, I'm going to invite you that if you want to come up here and, and pursue searching out the love of God, that we can do that together. Amen? Let's